Okay, so that's, that's the preamble to my epilogue. A philosopher and a no pardon me, a novelist, a philosopher and a musician walk into a bar. Sensing their ingress is the setup for a joke, the novelist immediately goes on a tangent about her distaste for metafiction, stemming from a deeply unsatisfying Twitter conversation she composed last year between Nietzsche and Kim Kardashian. <laughs> the philosopher, however, was much more keen to indulge in the gay, given that for her, a joke is as meaningful or as meaningless as any other proposition. The musician, however, was already laughing his head off. <laughs> <clears throat> do animals get earworms? Yes. But they do so only by radicalizing what they mostly are. A refrain, a rat, or better still, a bug. Unga Zypha. We call a refrain any aggregate of matters of expression that draws a territory and develops into territorial motifs. <clears throat> a bug is nothing but a motif. For instance, there's the kind of a bug that David Foster Wallace likens to the pure late date American tourist, an insect on a dead thing. And then there's the bug that Harry Call, in a couple of the conversation, believes is hidden in his apartment. The bugger got bugged, huh? It's a famous quotation from the film. But a bug is also a flaw that lives in computers. People, too. Live in people, that is, a bug. Parasite, trespasser, defect. But what about obsession? An excessive enthusiasm that makes a virtual theme of its intrusive motif is the most radical kind of bug. Why? Because it's all refrain. Sheer vital enthusiasm in the shape of a going that goes compellingly nowhere. Or just the same, a spirited going that stays intensely where it is so that one feels what it feels like to be alive apart from any circumstance of life's being actually lived. Or something dead, a buggered bugger, a glitch, a vital fixation. So what then should we make of that poor thing? It's a cockroach, of course, and it's doing circles on the concrete floor of a laundromat in Florence. <laughs> maybe it's composing a new refrain, maybe it's mad, or maybe it's just art. I suppose it could be any or even all of these. Its rotations are clearly a motif, and its matters of expression have all the marks of insanity. And there is, indubitably, an aesthetic yield to this aimless turn of the screw. But then again, maybe it's all just an act. Not a fake-out, but an event. Yet, even so, a fake-out is still an act. Still an event, so fake or not, it's still an act. But what's an act, really? What's the difference between a bare activity and an act? In one sense, an act <coughs> is a spatial-temporal occurrence, but that's boring. A spatial-temporal occurrence may as well be everything that is the case. <laughs> In another sense, an act is a formal affair, one having to do with everything that is the case that shows phases of incipience, acceleration, consummation, and cadence. An act is everything that is the case with a phase structure, said another way. Said another way again, an act is an absolute value for everything that is the case that will come to not be the case. An act is change, so to speak. Now, this act is unboring. And it brings us to an interesting place where we can talk not only about the conceptual value of the act, but what it says about activity in general, in a general sense, as something that has vital and non-vital profiles. And this also means that we can talk about enthusiasm as a kind of appearance, as a directly perceived quality of acts in their form coming to pass. So again, what can we make of that thing's gyrations? Well, it's obvious that this bug has an act. From here, it looks like an act in the shape of a useless behavior. In a way, it makes perfect sense. <clears throat> an act's virulence, I mean. Acts are particularly contagious things, especially for bodies that live on a diet of flows and stows, speeds, arrest, terrific excitement, calm, subtle activation, and dreamy lapses. But that's presuming a lot about bodies. 
Aren't bodies what they are, rather than not what they aren't, because they exhibit a capacity to grow out of acts? Bodies being exactly what acts are called that keep themselves going. That there's any body at all is the case when acts are drawn into other acts in rising phases, in falling ones too. Involvement is a good word. So is concatenation. <laughs> a body is an involved concatenation of acts, a matrix even, another good word. Although if acts are first, then bodies are really the exact reflection of the former, being the counterpoint of the functional matrix of activities, being also the syntactical way of this sentence too. By reason of the involvement of act, pardon me, by reason of the involvement of its acts with each other, I understand now what I meant when I said that acts are contagious. An act always involves other acts. It's always pressing for expansion and engulfs whatever substance will serve to implement it. Which means that it will meet either entrainment or repression by other acts. Which means also that it will exercise such on others. Will give as good as it gets, in other words. But that's not quite right about contagion, even though I just suggested it. <laughs> Why shouldn't thought include poor suggestions and dead ends? How much of our thinking actually comes to anything? And I don't mean that 99% of ideas that we hold uh, to be true that are unterminated perceptually, as William James insists. I mean the 100% of inklings or velleities or guesses or gists or daydreams that have absolutely no truck with truth and so have no reason to substitute for knowing in the completed sense. Thinking that is simply expressing its own coming to pass is a thinking that doesn't recognize itself as thought, it doesn't recognize itself as anything but the pulse of an ongoing involvement. Which is not to say that it doesn't value its own involvement since every act is motivated by a vital situation that refuses to know in advance what it can become. I don't think the cockroach has caught an act, then. I think it's better said that it's caught in the act of its own involvement of refusing to become what it can become. Well, maybe it's not better said that way because it seems like I'm saying that it's doing something wrong. <laughs> Which, as far as I can tell, it's not the problem with idioms, I suppose. Also, the idiom of problems being a way of saying this differently. Antimetaboly being what this other way of saying this differently is a case of. Perhaps I should have said that the bug is stuck in the act. Doubtless that would have been clearer. But then I would have had the occasion to write antimetaboly which is another good word. <laughs> a great word, maybe. <laughs> now that I've written antimetabolic twice, I should go on with what I was going on about. <laughs> Actually, it's three times that I've written antimetabolic. <laughs> Make that four. <laughs> Language really can get away from you sometimes. <laughs> is being stuck in the act, to get back to what I was saying about the cockroach which is also to get back to what I was saying earlier about enthusiasm. Although I was thinking of enthusiasm as a bug then, now I'm thinking about the bug as an act in suspense. That's a good way to think about it. Or at least an act whose action finds its practical force and normal function in suspense is. But does it make any sense to think about an act apart from its performance? Well, I suppose I should have thought of that before writing it down. As I said, language can get away from you sometimes. <laughs> thinking too, apparently. I like the idea that thinking can get away from the one doing it. Like a daydream, like an earworm. Charles Peirce likened anonymous thinking to a strange intruder. What he meant is that thought has both ego and non-ego profiles. Thought can still be thought, even if no one in particular is doing it. 
like listening apart from what's heard, or breathing apart from lungs. But what about an act apart from its performance? What's it doing without its doer is actually being done? As, I, as far as I can tell, it's thought. By which I mean that thought is the case of a doing without its actually being done. Or the way the extra being of what's being done does. This doesn't make sense. But it still has a value, if only because colorless green ideas sleep furiously. <laughs> Which is to say, fuck all. <laughs> Actually, to say fuck all is to say fuck all. Whereas to say colorless green ideas sleep furiously is to mean fuck all. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing that one can mean nothing and still make sense. But maybe it's not that amazing. A false proposition makes just as much sense as a true one. One plus one is greater than three, for example, it makes as much sense as the case that all babies are illogical and that nobody is despised who can manage a crocodile. Therefore, illogical persons are despised, <laughs> says Lewis Carroll. Perhaps what matters isn't the truth, but the sense of things. Because truth value is fixed to the formal relations that sense makes saleable, we always have as much truth as we deserve in accordance with the sense of what we say. We never run a truth deficit. Truth is cheap, in other words. <laughs> sense, however, is costly. It seems we never have enough sense and are always trying to make it. Well, not make it, but extract it from the problems that differential elements in the reciprocal relations pose. I hope that last sentence meant something because it came close to impressing me for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> the cost of sense is, li is linked to its expression and concerns the way in which things matter. Expressive value is what sense is worth, therefore. I can only guess that this is why mime gets away with what he does makes a living from showing that sense is extracted and expressed from things as what effectively occurs, is what I mean. Trapped in a box, tug of war. Sense stripped bare by its pantomime, even. <laughs> Being extracted and expressed makes me think of sense as something like oil except nothing died to make sense, although I may have come close to it a few sentences ago. <laughs> I wonder if there's any sense to the idea of peak sense. Like, like oil, peak sense isn't a marker of depletion, but the point of maximum production, just to be clear. Wouldn't maximum sense make for a truer world? It couldn't, because sense does not ground truth without also allowing the possibility of error. A better question, would sense entail more or fewer minds? <laughs> so there's clearly a correlation between the number of minds, minds that exist at any given time and what we can say is true or false. <laughs> <laughs> minds make sense. True and false are not crocodiles. Therefore, <laughs> nonsense is not a crocodile. And I'd rather be caught in the act than trapped in a box. Hedgehogs, even. <laughs> <laughs> what should we make of that poor thing? It's caught in the same enthusiasm that caught the cockroach, obviously. Or at least it's expressing the sense of it. Like a mime. Pure enthusiasm like a bug. A feeling of the conditions of life without a life being actually lived. But how on earth did this enthusiasm pass from the cockroach to the hedgehog? As far as I can tell, it's pure fiction. I like this. One morning, when Grigor Samsa woke from troubled dreams, he did not find himself transformed in his bed into a horrible vermin. That happened long ago. 
Instead, he found himself walking in clockwise, clockwise circles on the concrete floor of a laundromat somewhere in Florence. <laughs> his memory was not great these days. Since becoming vermin, he's been less and less able to separate his perception of things from his actions. For Gregor, the world had lost that impassive edge that allowed him to plot his life along an ordered series of mutually limited, distinct images. He could no longer plan for the future or take stock of all that he'd learned in life. He tended now to make his way melody-like from impulse to impulse, much as an improvising musician finds her way from one phrase to the next. And though he still had a sense of absurdity, if not humor, he couldn't express it like he used to. He could no longer tell jokes or explain why he was late for work. Everything was motivated always, it seemed to him, for action. Sounds, movements, shapes, and rhythmic changes, like swinging, revolving, and flowing, had become for greater extensions of directly felt inward and outward acts, springing from impulse, ambient impressions, and opportunities. That he couldn't remember how he arrived in this moist and linty world of dirty socks and sweaty underwear mm -hmm. was therefore not particularly surprising, nor particularly worrying. But the enthusiasm he felt at every turn did make him wonder, why am I walking in circles? Which immediately led him to ask, what's a circle? <laughs> as quickly as Gregor fought, uh, pardon me, as quickly as Gregor forgot this question, he woke from whirling dreams to find that he had indeed had, tra me, had transformed into a mouse, a less horrible vermin indeed. With no brown carapace, no slightly domed belly, or spindly legs to wave about helplessly before him, Gregor was pleased with his pointed snout, small rounded ears, scaly tail, and light gray fur. He was also pleased to learn that he was an, as enthusiastic as ever. <laughs> <laughs> Due to the melodic character of his perception, he felt he could venture from home on the thread of a tune. <clears throat> and while he wasn't certain what exactly a tune was, or thread for that matter, he was glad for the refrain. He did notice, however, that his excursions were rather brief, and in fact, quite dizzying. <laughs> but that wasn't really a problem for Gregor, given that his sheer enthusiasm seemed to conduct him away from the humbler reaches of practical reason and towards the purity of speculation. Knowing his micro-migration wouldn't appear this way was actually quite amusing to him, since speculation is almost always aligned with the kind of thinking that resolves itself as the subtraction from the commotion of ecologies that compose experience. How could anyone believe that he was full of thought? Maybe if he were a cat, they would. <laughs> <laughs> Cats, Gregor surmised, have a way of casting their enthusiasm beyond the envelope of their skin, of making thoughts contribution to the feltness of experience, something that belongs to the total act and not just its reflective contemplation. And as if to prove a point, Gregor found in the purity, purity of his speculation that his rodential enthusiasm had an, had an effect already become the very thing uh, that he was thinking, that he was thinking doing. It was as though life's spinning idol were the refrain of change as such, and thought the vector through which the enthusiasm of metamorphosis comes to virtual expression. For Gregor, this meant that to know what it's like to be a cat is an aesthetic matter. To know what it's like to be a cat, or to know what it's like for a cat to be a cat, is a trivial distinction, insofar as what it's like only concerns the esqueness or the extra being of the feline as it's taken up in creative ways. In Gregor's case, a, s a specifically imaginary uptake of extra feline enthusiasm finds expression in an extra, extra rodential enthusiasm that, as far as he could tell, was equally the imaginary uptake of a specifically written uptake of extra rochity. In this regard, he concluded that there's no limit to the extent to which he could think himself into the extra being of another, another's enthusiasm. And with this thought, Gregor's tale of metamorphosis became a tale of transmorphosis. For if Gregor's thinking himself into the extra being of a cat, of a mouse, of a cockroach, or a gorilla even, is a matter of expression, and writing takes expression to the limit, then perhaps by taking up his species overspill into creative language, the writer of these words could think his way <laughs> into a writerly produced enthusiasm or extra noetic refrain that would take on the appearance of a daydream 
as a daydream, maybe even more than the sentence runs on, the force of its own contemplation of what it could become without actually becoming those things so as to make its minor doing felt as a thought going intensely nowhere more exciting than the idea that from above spins and stalls could be woven a yarn about act forms and sense making that makes as much sense as it needs to make in order to accomplish the specifically written uptake of the writer's extra being that would take on the appearance of a daydream whose discursive drift, maybe even more than this paper, is driven by the sheer enthusiasm of contemplating what it could become without actually meaning those things so as to make its digressions felt as thought becoming intensely nothing more significant than the demonstration that from a buggered motif could be composed a line of thinking of which mimes and fictions make as much sense as needed to express the writer's extra being as a semblance of a thought in the making of an occasion of experience that by any other name is thought in the act of its own contemplation of refusing to know in advance what it can do to give its form of doing the appearance of not doing anything more involved than spinning yarns about bugs and mimes and animals that give expression to a little something extra whose value is worth as much as a completely unnecessary, if not entirely unfunny, joke. <laughs> <laughs>